Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Dr. Maida Galvez, and together with Perry Sheffield, I co-direct the Region 2 Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, which you see here. Um, we serve New Jersey, New York, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Let's see if I can switch this. Well, you use the, yeah. This? Okay. Thank you. We're also the coordinating center here for the New York State Children's Environmental Health Center. And you see that wonderful community of pediatric environmental health experts across the state. Um, you can read more about it in these two articles from the American Journal of Public Health and the National Academies. Um, these are go-to resources for you all when you have questions about environmental concerns from your families. We're thrilled to be celebrating Children's Environmental Health Day today. It's celebrated annually the second Thursday of October across the country as part of a national campaign launched nine years ago by the Children's Environmental Health Network to raise awareness about healthy environments for all children and their families, and especially low-income communities of color that are disproportionately burdened by environmental exposures. And we work together with diverse partners to translate the science into meaningful action that directly benefits environmental justice communities. We're really fortunate that New York State Senator um, Serrano of the 29th Senate District officially recognized today with this Senate proclamation, which I have here if anybody wants to read the hard copy. Um, uh, and I can't tell you how much this means to us. I will turn to this expert messenger to tell you what Children's Environmental Health Day is about. I can hit the play button. It's not hitting play. Sorry, I'm so technologically challenged today. Three, the aim of Children's Environmental Health Day is to rise awareness about the importance of clean air and water, safe food and consumer products, and healthy environments to children's health and development. <laughs> Three. Ah, uh, now I can hit the play button. <laughs> it's worth listening to twice. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, we lost the slideshow. Anyway, what were you going to say? <laughs> so, um, we can't thank you enough for being here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you, they say that um, you should have three key messages and repeat them three times. <laughs> so that's exactly what this expert messenger does. I am so excited to introduce our speaker today. Thank you all so much for being here and tuning in. Um, Doctor, this has been on our wish list for many, many years to have him here. He's currently the pediatric medical director for the New York State Medicaid program. He uh, received his medical degree from the Sackler School of Medicine at Tel Aviv University, completed his residency in pediatrics at Jacoby Medical Center in the Bronx. Um, I think he literally created the Pediatric Environmental Health Elective when he asked Joel Foreman many years ago if he could rotate with him. Um, uh, and was that the first resident to ever do that? Um, he went on to complete a fellowship here in pediatric environmental health and also earned a master's in public health from Mount Sinai. During his fellowship, with the support and mentorship of many, but Dr. Joel Foreman in particular, he developed guidelines on the identification and management of lead exposure in pregnancy and went on to support that same effort for the Centers for Disease Control. After fellowship, he took on several roles with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, primarily overseeing environmental public health programs and worked on a large variety of issues, including lead exposure, adulterated consumer products, climate change, and environmental risk communication. For a short period of time, he also oversaw the department's work to address public health issues related to substance use. 
In 2013, he was appointed director of the New York State Department of Health Center for Environmental Health, which has a broad mission to apply scientific, medical, engineering, and public health expertise to identify, characterize, prevent, and mitigate risks to human health from living and working environments. In addition to supervision of central office staff, Dr. Graber worked closely with regional office staff to coordinate environmental health program activities implemented by the department's nine district offices and 36 county and city health departments. Throughout his career in public health, Dr. Graber maintained his clinical practice for almost 10 years in the pediatric emergency department of St. Barnabas Hospital in the Bronx for five years as a full-time primary care emergency um, primary care pediatrician in Saratoga County, and then as a hospitalist in the Children's Hospital at Albany Medical Center. Returning to the Department of Health in 2022, Dr. Graber now works on policy issues related to the care of children and their families in the New York State Medicaid program. In our field, we often say that the most important clinical interventions are good public health policy. It's why we're so very lucky to have Dr. Graber in his role at New York State Medicaid and really excited to learn from his path today. Thank you, Dr. Graber. Uh, thank you, Dr. Galvez. Um, she forgot to mention that we had shared an office together for two years during fellowship, uh, and she was my chief resident in, in, uh, in residency. So um, I want to thank you for inviting me here. I am not only excited to come back to Mount Sinai and be back in the same room, and you forgot, I did give, grand, I did give a presentation, I don't know if it was Grand Rounds, uh, probably about... I don't know, 11 years ago. Uh, and I, you, I pulled up that slideshow to make sure I wouldn't use the same slides again so that you wouldn't get bored. Uh, because of course, everybody remembers that. But um, anyway, today, what I'd like to do is, um, first, oh, the other thing I wanna thank you for is inviting me here because it means I got to take the Amtrak train ride down along the Hudson River, which is probably one of the most beautiful views. And it, made it, very imp it makes it impossible to do any work. Um, but not only were the, the fall foliage, but I always see bald eagles. Now, I saw three on this trip. Now, when I was a kid, you know how many bald eagles we would see? Never, none, none. They were almost gone. So it's a demonstration of what good policy can do. And now I can see bald eagles. So um, I, I want to talk today about a framework for considering policy. I'm a conceptual person. I don't like to get down into the weeds on process. I like to think about what it is that's gonna guide me through my thinking as I consider each decision and each um, uh, aspect of implementation of new programs. So first of all, financial disclosure, I have nothing to declare. I also have no money because I have two kids in college and tuition is quite expensive. Uh, and I wanna start here because uh, when we, we think about ourselves as um, policy people, are we really policy people or are we pediatricians? And I've, I've taken a lot of time in my career to contemplate you know, who I really am. I would say that when I first started, if you go back even 10 years ago, not even the 20 years ago or the 24 years ago when I graduated medical school, um, I, I couldn't think of myself as what am I? I wanna be everything, right? I wanna be everything. I wanna do this, I wanna do that. And nothing, there was nothing that I didn't wanna to try to do. I wanted to be an epidemiologist. I wanted to be you know, the parks commissioner. I wanted to be the, the, uh, the, um, you know, the, the making all the decisions in public health. And, uh, and, and reality is, is that um, I'm really, the more I think about it, I'm a pediatrician. That's, that's the viewpoint, that's my perspective, that's where my foundation is. And I have here a picture of Abraham Jacoby. Um, and here's some interesting things that you should know. Is one, he, he made this, he said this quote that I have up on the screen right now, uh, back in I think 1904, um, he was uh, uh, the uh, consider, he's considered the father of American uh, pediatrics. Uh, he was a professor of childhood diseases at New York Co Medical College um, from 1861, or from 1867 to 1870. He was medical department, he was chair of the medical department at the University of the City of New York. He taught at Columbia University for 30 years. Um, and guess what else he did? He also founded the, um, the first Department of Pediatrics at a general hospital. Does anybody know where that was? It's Mount Sinai. So, so the founder of, you know, he's also, he founded this department. So I'm quite honored to be here. Um, he was really a key figure in the movement to improve 
child health care and welfare in the United States. Uh, and oops, one of the thing just to say from his quote is that he's not just talking about health care. He's thinking about he's thinking about the bigger bigger picture, uh, which is, you know, it's that it's not just that you're at the bedside. Right. So you're not just a clinical physician, but you also work on school boards. Right. That's also an environment that's important to kids and health departments and legislatures um, and advisors to judges and jury. And I'll get into all this because all this really makes a lot of sense when you start to understand the environment in which we make policy. So um, despite the fact that I did my residency in a hospital named after Dr. Jacoby, uh, my disposition uh, to do more than tasks and the medical school and residents uh, and um, just so you know, this is this slide. There's no animation here, right? This is really everything I learned about public health and population health and medical school and residency. Um, you could take this slide and also say this is everything I learned about coding and billing. Uh, and um, this is really, you know, in spite of in spite of all this. But you know, this may have changed over time. I I assume there's a lot more in education now to try to think about the bigger picture. But we were really focused on. The, um, the care of our, our patients. So I was taught mostly clinical medicine, maybe some things about research, maybe some things about understanding and interpreting research, but for the benefit of my individual patients. Uh, but however, I just wanna take this one other step and say maybe I was really taught everything I needed to know about public health and population health. So during my pediatrics rotation in the third year of medical school, um, a professor sat us down and he drew a Venn diagram on um, in those days, we didn't have smart boards, just a piece of big piece of paper, right? I forgot what they call those things, flip boards or what, or what have you. Uh, and his Venn diagram had three circles. And the three circles were, you know, clinical, which is your care of the patients, your interaction, your relationship with the patients, which is at the core of what we do. That is probably the most important thing as a pediatrician. That's the essence of our, um, of our profession. It's, it's that relationship we have with our patients and understanding them. The second circle he drew was, was teaching, which is to prepare the next generation. And I, I heard a lot of great things about teaching and I've been uh, uh, honored to have many great mentors during my career. And uh, what teaching does is one, it forces you to stay up to date on all the latest information, all the latest research. Um, and also medical students keep you honest, right? So, you know, if you don't know something, you don't know it, right? The medical students will certainly let you know that. And, um, and the other thing is, is the third circle that he drew was research. Now, um, when it comes to research, even though I did my, my fellowship here, uh, which was, uh, you know, pediatric environmental health, and it's, it's primarily supposed to be a, a research oriented one, and to no fault of my, you know, great mentors and, and the program itself, I really was not interested in research. Uh, and, and when I first started here, I actually, um, Dr. Foreman and Dr. Landrigan had gotten a contract with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And um, the day before my fellowship started, they said, here, come help us with this project for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, which Maida spoke about, which was developing these guidelines for identification and management of pregnant women with lead exposure. And, uh, and, and so, so really, I want to change this circle and, and just say that, you know, my circle is not research. It can be your circle, but it's not my circle. My circle is, is pub, was public health, which I've now put a slash and said population health for reasons I'll explain a little bit further on in my talk. Uh, and then, of course, there's advocacy, uh, community health work. And I want to say just a note about that because I, one of the things that I, I want to try to try to do is is kind of differentiate what is policy and what is advocacy, right? So a lot of times, like I did the AAP legislative conference uh, when I was a resident in my third year of residency, which was excellent. It told me a lot about politics and a lot about talking to elected officials. Um, that's advocacy. That's not what I'm talking about today. When I mean policy, uh, I'm not discussing lobbying or taking a role in petitioning elected officials for change in statute. I'm describing my perspective on policy, which is working in a system with all the partners and developing policies that improve the health and well-being of New Yorkers. You know, and I believe we all have a role, and that's what I want to try to convey today. 
Um, and uh, you saw my, my framework, which is the five Ps. I'm gonna explain that at the very end. So you gotta wait to the very end to understand what I mean by that. Uh, but policy can occur at any level. It's from your own practice to you know, federal programs uh, that provide services that kids need. So, so this, like a, you know, these overlaps, this, this Venn diagram, you can change this around as much as you want, but I found this in my career very helpful. And sometimes, right now, the clinical is kind of small. I cover one week in a month at the hospital. Um, and along with that, you know, I get a, um, I've had one since I started two years ago back at the health department. I've only had one uh, pediatric resident rotate with me. So um, a little uh, plug there if you're interested. And then, um, uh, and, then uh, and then, you know, my po population and public health circle is my biggest right now. So um, I would say that when I started in the field, um, I would, you know, when I got into, started working for the New York City Department of Health, besides being told that it's never a dull moment, which is true, and I could not possibly list all the topics that I got involved in during my time uh, in government, because it's just endless. When I look at the folders and folders and folders of every single item that I was involved in, it's really endless and it's exciting and it's a lot of fun. Uh, but public health, it was separate from population health. We thought of population health as, well, that's the delivery of healthcare, right? That has to do with medicine. We don't get involved with that. There's a silo between the public health side of an agency and the, the Medicaid side of an agency or the insurance side of an agency, right? We do our public health work. They do their delivery of health care. They're not the same thing at all. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and we generally think of public health as the role of government, right? So government is the one who implements public health policy and creates regulatory programs and uh, and uh, does the epidemiological work to identify and, and monitor diseases. Um, but, you know, um, uh, population health is really, you know, more literally, it's like the, the, the health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of such outcomes within that group. Um, it's just a simple way of thinking about, it, like I said, provision of, of health care. And these two circles were separate. I wasn't gonna do a fancy animation, right? But you can see, you know, there's an overlap between the two. And I think that overlap is getting bigger. Um, and, and, and it's actually, this is an exciting time to be involved in public policy around children's health. Because I really feel that population health and public health, that these two overlaps are getting greater and greater with time, which gives us a lot of additional ability to work on, on many issues. Um, and when I got to the return to the health department, um, you know, I was talking to my boss, Dr. Douglas Fish, and, uh, and, and he said to me, you know, uh, Medicaid is public health. And I was like, I don't think so. But then, you know, like as I've been working there, I believe I'm understanding what he was talking about. And this quote was actually from a student, okay? The student said, a student intern said, well, Medicaid is a critical vehicle for public health innovation. So um, I think that's important to keep in mind, especially as I talk to you about some of the things that we're working on. Uh, so let's just talk quickly about population health and what the framework for population health is. If many of you may recall, if you've heard this before, population health and the triple aim. And the triple aim was focused on improving the patient experience with healthcare, improving the health of the population and reducing costs. Uh, those, you know, three were the three, I, I don't know if we called them pillars at the time, but that's what drove the policy for, uh, for, for population health. And they thought that improving provider experience or improving patient experience was contra, is counter to the cost saving aspect of it. Uh, and over time, what we've learned is that that is not the case. And physicians, because of that, and providers were getting burned out over time and making the work more and more difficult for them. So this fourth pillar was added, which is improve provider experience with healthcare, which I think is incredibly important for those of us who worked primarily doing clinical work, uh, particularly in the last five years, understand this profoundly, uh, that you know, we can keep working, 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 but you know, if, if the, the job is not satisfying to us, then, then we're just gonna get burned out, no matter how much we care about our patients. Uh, and, um, and the fourth, the fifth piece, which is, it was recently added, I'd say, I think around 2022, which is the consideration of health equity. And I'm gonna talk about health equity uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, from the public health side, you know, the, um, 
framework that was used was uh, the, uh, the uh, original health, essential public health services. It was published back in 1994. And it, it serves as this framework for carrying out the mission of public health. It's always considered like the broader you know, public health with like healthcare, I guess, being a part of it. I didn't really see it that way, but I'd say that it's much clearer now with these new revisions, because if you see here at the very center of the 10 essential public health services, which you can, you can look at this on the CDC website, um, at the very center of it, of it is, is equity. Uh, and that's an important term now when we think about improving uh, a policy and improving the health of, for children. Uh, so, um, now, some of you, this may bring you back. Some of you may not. I see there's a, at least one person from, who's worked with me in the health department here in the audience. Uh, and I see you know, Dr. Foreman is here now as well, who's on the Board of Health for the city of New York. And um, the, the, uh, the health impact pyramid. So this was a, a framework that was developed by Tom Frieden. And, and at the top of this pyramid, are, um, is counting education, uh, then clinical interventions a little bit further down, longer lasting protective interventions further, changing the context to make individual default decisions healthy, and then finally socioeconomic factors at the bottom. So what's important about this pyramid is that as you get closer to the top, um, these are interventions, one that require you know, more uh, individual effort in order for the person to achieve better health. Um, and at the, at the bottom, it's, these are factors that uh, are, um, it becomes less of an individual choice and more of just sort of the default that, that it helps individuals become healthy with le less effort on their own. Uh, and so as we get to the bottom of this pyramid, we also have a much larger increase uh, in the impa impact on the population as a whole. Uh, the other thing that you should keep in mind, particularly if you're thinking about policy, is that um, it requires a lot more political capital to change the uh, to have an, to to change to work at the bottom of this pyramid than it does at the top. It's really easy to create a brochure. Nobody's going to really argue with you about the brochure. They're going to they might argue with you about what it says exactly and fight over words. And it could take you a whole day to write one sentence. But um, really, it is it is not as difficult as implementing a program that is going to change uh, socioeconomic factors for individuals in our communities. Uh, so the, um, just give a couple of examples. So like, you know, counseling education, I, I separate out anticipatory guidance from pediatricians from this because it's been shown in studies that it's much more impactful on, on individual behavior than just counseling and education. So it's a different idea. And I think as pediatricians, we understand that. Uh, and what anticipatory guidance is, it's very different because it involves a very strong relationship uh, with your patients and your families. And there's a lot of trust involved in that. And it's a lot of, I'm not gonna talk about risk communication today, but that is you know, an important uh, factor in risk communication and that whether your message is accepted by the person you're speaking with. So this is really just about you know, educational programs to try to change behaviors. Uh, where we go down to clinical interventions, and these are things that, that tend to um, have a longer or bigger impact. So like, for instance, like asthma classification, that was a big change in my year practice as a pediatrician from the time I started uh, to, to today. I mean, now we're doing smart therapy, right? And this is a, an amazing advance in terms of uh, managing uh, persistent asthma. Uh, and, um, and then another thing, just because it's Children's Environmental Health Day, environmental history taking, okay, that is, a, that is actually considered, that and screening for things like lead, you know, these are clinical interventions that have a longer lasting impact. Uh, and then long lasting protective interventions, okay, the most effective thing that we do as pediatricians, if you can boil it down to one thing in essence, it's immunizations, right? It's vaccines, right? And, and so um, I always put that at the top. And, uh, and um, there are other things as well. If we think about it in terms of public health programs, things like inspections and enforcement activities, uh, modifications of, of uh, uh, homes, good manufacturing practices for nutritional supplements uh, and third party certification, you know, carbon monoxide tech. These aren't completely, you know, like without possibility of things not going right, but they are much more protective. And then you know, this is where we were told, the next one, changing the context, this is where we were told when I worked for the health department 15 years ago, you know, that this, this, is, the, this is where we can have an impact. This is changing the context, change the environment 
so that it, an individual's default choice is the healthy choice. So some of the big campaigns when I was with the city health department were around, um, you know, putting, you know, calorie counts on, uh, on menu boards or uh, reducing uh, or eliminating trans fats uh, and uh, trying to get more fruits and vegetables out in the, you know, in an affordable way out at the front of where people do their shopping. So changing the context, change um, the healthy communities, health, healthy neighborhoods type of programs that change the actual structure. Like you look around here in New York City at all the bike lanes and all the tree-lined streets and how much more pleasant it is to take a walk uh, uh, on a street than before. All these things were changed. Uh, these are things that changed the context and made it a person's ability to become to be healthy much easier. What what has changed since we heard that said, oh, you can't do anything down here. I remember this. You know, this, I used to say this, right? Well, we can't do anything to change people's socioeconomic factors from a public health perspective. Um, well, that's different now. That's changed. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that in a little bit. And I think this is an incredible opportunity for us uh, to really make a difference. And the way it's changing is by addressing health equity. So what is health equity? Uh, well, I mean, I like this. OK, this is not the official Department of Health. Uh, graphic on it. I, I swapped it out because I'm a cyclist and I like to bike all the time is wherever I can go. And, um, and equality is giving every single person the same bicycle. Well, it's not going to fit everybody. It's not going to work for everyone. There's not everybody can ride every kind of bicycle. So that's, that's equality. Equity is designing the bicycles so that everybody can ride them. Right, so designing bicycles that are fit for each individuals, and the the Department of Health official uh, definition. We do have a statutory definition, which is really you know big, uh, which is which is really terrific for New York State. We have a statutory definition of health equity, and from that, the health department derived the following definition: health equity means everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthy, where no one is limited in achieving optimal health because of who they are or where they live. So when we think about kids, it's, it's you know, the places that they live, w live, learn, grow and play, right? So, and some of the, and of course, teenagers and they work. Uh, so uh, I just wanna give a little bit of a background because I had the benefit of working in government and my, in the first few weeks of, of working for government, the general counsel for the city health department sat me down and gave me a great lecture on understanding uh, public health law, statute, um, regulation, uh, guidance, case law, what it all means and, and how, it, how, it, how it allows us as public health policy folks to carry out our work. Uh, and so I'm the son of a lawyer. I am not a lawyer. Uh, and uh, I didn't really, you know, I don't, I didn't understand a lot about law before, and I think it's really helpful to understand these differences, because um, statute, right, is the, is, is the, um, uh, well, let me, let me start with this. So government agencies, right, we act within the context of the law, regulation, and guidance issued at the federal, state, and local level. So law can provide, it can establish the authority of an agency, uh, to carry out programs, uh, and it can include requirements and obligations, establish restrictions on programs, et cetera. So we can't do anything unless, you know, the statute allows us to do it or it gives us authority to do that. And, it, you know, maybe within our agency and maybe within a different agency, and it's understand to, that it's very complex, uh, the statutory environment, because, um, you know, these, these have been developed over the last... Uh, you know, a couple of hundred years, uh, and it's not something that's new, and, uh, and, and, and we, we have to work within that. Regulations, uh, these are sort of the more detailed, and I'm simplifying this because this is the way I understand it, because it makes sense for me, but regulations are the more detailed requirements of a program or service, um, and, and they, they provide, you know, uh, a lot more in terms of exactly how the... Um, uh, the programs uh, have, are, are implemented. And then guidance, it further clarifies the regulation, but it's not, they're generally not binding. Uh, and, and then case law, these are the decisions of the courts on lawsuits re related, to the, related to the programs um, as seen within, within this, this legal environment. 
And what's, what's the other thing to understand about this is that statute is really difficult to change. That takes a lot of work. It's a lot of effort, a lot of political capital, and so on. Regulation is a lot easier to change. It's, it's not impossible. Um, it depends on you know, the, the uh, details of the government in which you work. And then uh, guidance, that's, that's very easy to change. That's something we can do on a programmatic level. And then, of course, case law, you know, we, just, we just have to uh, do it, the, you know, work around what the decisions of the courts are. So um, I just want to look here, you know, what we're looking at here is a chart of the annual death rate is recorded in the vital, in the vital statistics of the New York State Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. You'll note that the, the rate, uh, the daily death rate has declined drastically since the 1800s. And the important thing to understand here is that it's not because of the advances of medical care, but it's primarily because of the advances in hygiene. Uh, particularly, you know, clean drinking water. The, in 1842, the Croton Aqueduct was established. Uh, the Board of Health was established um, in 1866, primarily to deal with hygiene issues, including things like trash and sewage. Uh, there's chlorination of drinking water, food safety, improved housing, et cetera, et cetera. These are the things that had the biggest impacts, and of course, the development of antibiotics and immunizations. Uh, and then, you know, finally, the smallest changes over time, but they are significant and important, are the changes in actual clinical care of individuals. Um, you know, and uh, the authority to carry out these programs, you know, was established in law, such as the founding of the FDA and refinement of regulatory programs over time. So, of course, childhood led, which is where, you know, I got my, my start and my education. You know, this is the, um, an excellent uh, example of uh, uh, how, you know, policy and good policy can have an impact on uh, a public health issue. And it, um, you know, in this case, you can see that we have here the declining, you know, rates of uh, a childhood um, blood, blood leads uh, over time. You know, and if you look back here, you know, I grew up in the 70s. Um, I would say, you know, pretty, pretty sure that my, my, uh, my blood level was higher than this average here because uh, I remember, you know, doing things like melting down fishing weights or cleaning my hands after painting the house with leaded gasoline, you know, things like that. And I remember the metallic taste in my mouth and the, um, and, and the stomach aches and all that stuff. And, and now we understand that that was all lead poisoning. Back then it was just like, oh, that was really stupid. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then removing, you know, these sources from the environment had this impact on reducing blood lead level. But one of the things to just keep in mind is that over time, uh, you know, blood lead levels have come down. Uh, we have a, we, you know, we, I always thought when I started 23 years ago, 20 years ago so far in fellowship, you know, I, everybody, I heard people say, oh, well, lead, lead poisoning, that's an issue that's going, gone away. That's, that's going away. We're, we're done with that. That's so not true. You know, we, we have a, a good understanding, you know, the science is strong that, that, you know, lead at any level is not safe, you know, for kids and that, and that we need to keep driving down lead, blood lead levels. And the, um, the other sources, the smaller sources, you know, are becoming increasingly important, the unusual sources, although deteriorating, you know, uh, uh, lead-based paint in older homes that are poorly maintained is still the major source of childhood lead exposure. Uh, and um, I'm gonna bring this up here because there's a great policy example I wanna talk about, which is, and I served on the, uh, on the, the federal, uh, um, uh, uh, the Federal Lead Poisoning Prevention Advisory Committee for uh, uh, Lead Exposure Prevention Advisory Committee for the CDC, and um, and and we had to make a policy decision here. Now, if you look here, first first of all, um, we see like these are the blood lead levels that were considered at, like an action level, you know, uh, by the CDC, and there was you know going back to the 60s before any of us you know, we're practicing medicine, you know, the blood level was considered 60, you know, before you, you take any action uh, for the patient, and then it was dropped to 40. And these were all based on some understanding about health impacts, you know, and health effects. Uh, and um, finally, you know, when I started practicing, it was down to 10 micrograms per deciliter. Uh, and all these, these numbers, though, they're, they're really not based on science. They're, they're sort of arbitrary, selected numbers saying, you know, here we are, uh, we, you know, we're just going to randomly select a number. And I was sitting in a room in, in Atlanta with uh, Dr. Markowitz and Dr. Foreman and Mary Jean Brown, and we're all talking about the, the lead and pregnancy uh, guidelines that we were working on. And we we're trying to come up with uh, a, a number saying, well, what's, 
you know, what, what should we tell, you know, providers uh, to do? What blood level should they take an action on? And, and Maury kept insisting, well, it's all just arbitrary, right? Because we know that there's no safe level of exposure. So it's just all arbitrary, all arbitrary. And so instead of thinking about it in this arbitrary way, we think about it the same way we do other lab tests, where we take a reference, we take a, a, the, the, um, the distribution of blood levels in a population, and we look for the high tail end of it. We say, what's greater than the 97.5th percentile? And that is going to be greater exposure than the rest of the population. And that's called a reference value. So now we don't use uh, a, a, a blood, we don't, we don't use a, um, term elevated blood level or an action level anymore. We use something called a blood lead reference value. And we had to make a decision recently on the committee about lowering this BLRV. Well, that, you know, lowering the BLRV, it's strictly based on the blood levels um, in the, from the NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey for children one to five. And, uh, and initially, you know, when the BLRV was first uh, developed, that 97.5th percentile was five micrograms per deciliter. However, the, the, that number dropped very quickly and down to, I think it was around 3.8 micrograms per deciliter in the next NHANE survey. And we know that it's not perfect science, right? Because this is a different population than what we would see, let's say, in an urban, you know, an urban area like New York City. And it's, it's also a, um, uh, uh, skewed because we know that the younger kids, particularly the around 18 months, you know, that lead exposure can, you know, is max, the lead exposure is maximum because of uh, certain behaviors that they engage in. Uh, and that's like hand to mouth behaviors, putting everything in their mouth, you know, playing around in, uh, on the floor of the house, and that the levels will come down over time. So we know that this is a very conservative, you know, way of looking at it. Uh, uh, but in terms of thinking about the greater policy, uh, you know, this is all, the BLRV is not an action level. It's not a single number where above that number you have to suddenly uh, take, you know, particular action, start doing home inspections or whatever it is. It's really about driving, it's a benchmark to drive primary care prevention. If you have a population of kids that are exceeding this BLRV, they know that in that community, actions have to be taken to, to, to continue to lower their exposures. Um, so let me talk about evidence to practice decision making, because this is a really important factor in, in policy making. So I, I happen to love this, this, uh, this graphic. It's from uh, the annual report of the government chief scientific advisor for the United Kingdom. And it was published in 2014. Uh, and actually, you know, I was giving a talk a few months ago, and I was trying to find this. I couldn't find it. But then when, you know, Maida said, oh, can you do this talk here? I was like, oh, I better find that one, because this is a really important graphic. I've never seen anything like it before, and I can't find anything else that, that really expresses it as well. And basically, what we're looking at here is um, a graphic where we're at the top of this, uh, this graphic, and um, at this top, We'll, we'll basically, um, hold on one second. Uh, uh, at the top of the graphic, we are in the you know, environment of kind of sound scientific evidence and practical experience. So it's easy to make a decision, develop regulations, guidance and standards. Um, like for instance, I feel like food safety is this way, right? We know a lot about food safety uh, and, uh, and, and we know a lot about you know, childhood lead exposures and there's like, there's things we can do to try to lower it and we have excellent scientific evidence to show that these interventions work. And, uh, and so really it's, it's pretty good. So it's just, we know it's good practice, it's easy to implement. Uh, we can develop it, there's just well understood risks. But then as we you know, move further down in the diagram, you see, that the scientific evidence is less strong. But there's a foundation, right? So we have a scientific foundation on which to base it. We have some experience. However, there's some uncertainty, and it becomes much more prominent. And we have to turn to things like peer review, you know, em employ judgment, various types of analysis, and some degree of, of, um, of what, you know, the, the, the field of pediatrics thinks is important, right? So there's some degree of sort of our values. 
uh, when we're thinking about these policy decisions, right? Because the science isn't necessarily there. So like that's where, like when we're developing these guidelines for lead in pregnancy or when we're thinking about lowering the, the blood lead reference value, you know, that's where it took like uh, a group of, of uh, you know, experts in the field to get together and discuss what it means to really make this policy change and to implement these, these recommendations. Um, but as we move even further down in the graphic, we're now in the realm of very poor or low quality evidence and, and other factors in the decision making become a lot more prominent. And these are things like, uh, you know, these are once again like the values, right? So what do we think is important? Uh, what do we feel is important at this time? Um, what does society think, right? So, you know, there's our thoughts about it because we're, you know, we're focused on pediatrics, but what, what, do, what do our parents think? What do the community think? What do other people think? Uh, and external, you know, stakeholder uh, engagement, it becomes a lot more important. Now, this is idealized in many ways because we know, you know, there are a lot of situations where uh, the, uh, uh, the science is very strong but uh, societal values uh, don't trust the science. And so, so there's a big disconnect here and everything just goes into chaos. Uh, and, and I just wanna say, you know, I wasn't gonna talk about politics at all, but I will say this one thing, that sometimes um, it creates crises. And crises, we shouldn't look at them as something bad. I mean, I know it's hard for us when we're in the middle of a crisis, but it's also an opportunity. So it's a, I always look for the silver lining in that crisis and say, all right, what could we, you know, what could we do to improve our public health programs? So, you know, in the, in the context of this particular, um, uh, you know, in this particular crisis. Uh, and so a good example, like for instance, I don't know if you remember the Legionella outbreaks, uh, I forget what year that was, 2016, 2015, um, here in New York City, you know, and uh, there was uh, a rush to try to figure out, you know, what's the source of this, what's the source of this, uh, this current outbreak. And it you know, gave us a true opportunity to really think about, we always wanted to do a regulatory program for, for cooling towers because we know that there's a possibility of exposure from Legionella from these cooling towers in air conditioning systems. And we were able to develop that regulatory program, which we think was a, you know, was a great opportunity and we were able to work with industry to develop that. Uh, so here's another way of looking at it. You know, this is, this is uh, a different graphic that I took from, uh, from a different source, but it, it basically it's the same idea. It's that this decision-making process and policy you know, takes place in the context of a lot of different factors like population characteristics, needs, values, preferences, uh, resources. Like, you know, we can decide that you know, every patient needs a particular intervention, but if there's only one doctor in the whole country who knows how to do it, we obviously can't. Uh, provide that, um, and uh, and and what's the best available research evidence, and then of course you know sort of the the societal values that environment environmental context all around everything that encompasses everything. Um, okay, so I want to quickly talk about something that I've been involved in since I coming back to the uh, uh, to the health department, and this is our evidence based benefits review advisory committee. Uh, this is, is established in, in law and it was reconvened um, this year after a five year hiatus. And uh, this, you know, the purpose of this is to, cons is to, to uh, consider matters, you know, that regard what we call a material change in the Medicaid program. So these are benefits that are, you know, very easy for us to make decisions around internally. So if you remember our policy decision framework that I showed you earlier, uh, these are things where um, it's not very clear, you know, all these other factors outside of just the science, it's not very clear to us whether or not we should offer a particular benefit within the program. And, and so this, this was uh, reestablished. We have one Mount Sinai, Doctor, Dr. Joe Trulio, and we have uh, uh, one pediatrician, Dr. Warren Siegel, I think some of you know him, uh, and he uh, is on the committee. And um, for instance, we had our first meeting, and in our first meeting, and I, uh, the, we considered whether or not to, um, we had the committee consider whether or not the Medicaid program should pursue coverage for uh, what's called collagen cross-linking for a condition of the eye called keratoconus a condition I'd never heard of until I was in uh, pediatric practice and one of my patients got it, uh, uh, was diagnosed with it. And, um, and so it's, it's something that I didn't even know existed, uh, uh, but apparently it does have a, a very big impact and that impact is actually greater 
is thought to be greater amongst Medicaid members. And it has to do with the uh, integrity of the cornea. It becomes kind of lax and then forms like a cone shape, uh, which uh, can disrupt visual acuity. Uh, that's not easily correctable by glasses or normal contact lenses. And that um, it, if it starts early and progresses quickly, the outcome is a lot worse. And so it's particularly an issue for adolescents. Uh, however, the scientific evidence for this collagen cross-linking procedure was quite poor. Um, and, uh, and, and in spite of that, the committee considered all of these other factors and made the recommendation that we should pursue coverage for keratoconus. Okay, so um, I want to now just focus on, uh, uh, on uh, population health aspect of work I've been on, uh, been working on. This is, you may have heard about this, it's called the Bronx Equity <clears throat> integrated care for kids. Um, so, you know, I'd stepped out of, of government and practiced primary pediatrics for five years in a suburb north of Albany, uh, and I had a surprisingly diverse population in every way, and I had a great time during this five years. And the, um, uh, uh, the, the thing I spent, I think, the most time agonizing over was sort of care coordination, care uh, navigation for my patients, and I spent an exorbitant amount of time trying to figure out how to get my patients where they needed to go and get them the services that they needed. Uh, and so when I came to the department, they were working on this, this uh, program. And this program uh, is really you know, focused uh, on, on that care coordination um, for, for kids. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about it because I think it's, it's really a great uh, example. So it's a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Medicaid and, and Medicare Innovation. And it, the model itself is, is uh, to create a child-centered local service and state payment model to reduce expenditures, improve quality of care through prevention, early identification, and treatment of priority behavioral health challenges and physical needs. So um, overall, you know, the idea of the INC model is to create a robust care navigation, care coordination system that fills in the gaps and connects families to the services they need. Um, which is either healthcare, behavioral, developmental healthcare, social care, as well as social care needs. And, and that's where we get to the equity aspect of things. It's those social care needs. So things that, that make it very difficult for our patients to get where they need to go and do the things that they need to do. Um, and as part of the model, you know, there's an in consideration of alter, al alternate payment models. Uh, something that is very difficult to conceive of in pediatrics because in general, when we think about pediatrics, uh, providing better care to kid me kids means that they're getting better access to services. So maybe it doesn't save us money. Maybe it costs us a little bit more up front so that we have um, savings in the long run uh, and not in the, in, the, in the same type of budget cycles that we generally think of. So I want you to take a look at this, this, um, this map right here. I know it's very, very complicated and there is a typo on it. If you find it, I'll, I'll buy you a cookie. Um, uh, but essentially this is the systems of care for kids in the Bronx. Okay, and you can see this is social care, it's also health care, it's behavioral health care. It is very, very complicated. How do we, you know, as a pediatrician, navigate all of this? And the idea of the, the INC model, one aspect of it, is to create a partnership council. Because when we think about it, relationships at the local level are what's truly key and important in getting kids to the services they need and connecting families to the services they need. And I want you to note something that we call this child and family centered. This is not just, you know, child centered, it's not just patient centered. It is really about that child and their family um, and, uh, and connecting them to all these things. So taking all of this together, building those partnerships, uh, and, uh, out of that comes, you know, ease in communication. Uh, and as well as um, uh, developing solutions to some very complicated problems. So uh, this is, if you're familiar with the Bronx, um, you know, uh, I know it's not the best map right here, it's kind of small, but if you look here, the Bronx is very interesting because, you know, we think, oh, the Bronx is small, you know, it's only like, what, like five miles wide, but you try to get from let's say, you know, the East Bronx, you know, over to, let's say, where, you know, uh, the West Bronx over by Riverdale, um, it could take you an hour. Uh, forget about, you know, traffic and buses. The Bronx was designed to get people into Manhattan and out of Manhattan, right? That's what it was designed for. So um, to, to create a geographic model that's going to create coordination for all the kids in these zip codes. So this is not based on 
one health system. This is based on the entire systems of care within that geographic area and pulling it all together. And the key to this has been the data-driven approach. It's a da hybrid data-driven approach where we take claims data and clinical data and we use the resources of the, the, uh, the health exchanges in the Bronx to uh, identify those kids who are most likely to have high needs, either social care needs or health care needs, and put them into a service integration level category. And then for the ones that are most likely to have the highest needs, have them followed up with a person who can then be their single point of contact for the entire systems of care that can help them navigate it if they don't already have that. So if they're not already in a health home. So I'm uh, just gonna talk briefly about the, because I only have a few minutes left. I'm gonna talk briefly about uh, the broader Medicaid program. You know, we cover in, Medicaid and uh, child health, um, uh, uh, the CHIP program, uh, the Child Health Plus program, uh, about two and a half million children in New York State. And, uh, and, and um, uh, we operate our benefits primarily through our Medicaid managed care plans. And uh, we do have a fee for service program, but most of the kids are in one of these Medicaid managed care plans. And, uh, you know, we could do things like we have a number of different levers that we can use, like incentivizing quality of care um, through quality reporting. You know, we're trying, you know, to push more pediatric specific uh, 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 alternative payment models or uh, population based payment models, as they're now calling them. And uh, we also can, you know, sort of not follow. We talked about statutes and rules and so on. Uh, you know, there's a very complicated system, Medicaid, the more I learn about it, the less I know. It's like that uh, quote, you know, where, and I don't know who it's attributed to, but E.L. Doctorow used it in a, in a Bronx High School of Science, which is my alma mater, um, uh, uh, graduation speech, where he said, as, you know, the light shines darkness into the knowledge and science, the, the, the rim of darkness expands. You know, so as we learn more, we learn that there's a lot we don't know. And that's what I feel like it's like in the Medicaid program, because it is a very complicated program. But there are ways for us to work with the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services to innovate. And um, one of them I talked about, which is our innovation uh, co uh, cooperative agreement we have, uh, but also through something called the waiver programs. And so it's an, something you should know, which is called the 1115 waiver. health and quality and deepen integration across the delivery system. And, and one of the things it does is it, it's really focused on uh, addressing uh, health-related social needs or the social drivers of, of, of health. <clears throat> and and um, the, I'm going to focus on one particular piece of this, which is the, the, the social care uh, networks and uh, this health-related health social needs delivery system. And so if you look here, it's gonna connect these various ecosystem partners that have critical roles in facilitating access to health-related social needs services. Um, and the lead is gonna be one of the, 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 the social care network leads. So I think for New York City, you're probably, because it's, um, you're up here and you probably serve patients in the Bronx as well, you know, it's gonna be um, uh, you know, public health solutions uh, and in the Bronx, uh, Somos Healthcare, those are the social care lead net networks. Uh, and, um, you know, they're going to also act as the fiduciary intermediary to manage the billing and payment for services, which is, you know, a big challenge, right? So if we want to implement um, social care, addressing social care needs, you know, in a Medicaid program, um, a lot of those services like housing, transportation, you know, they're provided through uh, community-based organizations that don't necessarily have the ability to, you know, bill Medicaid. So how do you pay them? Uh, and this is, this is an innovative way to, to find a solution to do that. And I'm sure you're familiar with, like, the Healthy Homes programs, you know, that carry out a lot of the, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, home remediation services. And, and, and those, you know, home remediation services um, you know, can't be billed directly to Medicaid, but, you know, through this mechanism, it's very possible that they, they can be if the contracts are set up 
with these social care networks appropriately. Okay, so, so in addition, you know, like we talked about with forming partnerships, right? So it's creating relationships at the local level, right? We all know foundationally, the most important thing is creating relationships. And, you know, the, the health-related social needs that'll be addressed are things like housing supports, nutrition, transportation, um, and case management uh, for, you know, populations that meet the eligibility criteria for these enhanced services. And I want to point out here, uh, because we're talking, you know, because we're pediatricians, right? So children who are at risk um, under the age of six, children under the age of 18 with a chronic condition, and juvenile justice involve youth, foster care youth, and those under kinship care. Um, so, so these are kids will be eligible for these enhanced services, um, and they're, you know, in the homes that they live in. Uh, so really important, it's important to engage with your social care network lead. I'm gonna say that for you, know, for you as pediatricians, we know that a lot of the, the biggest impacts are gonna be uh, on, these, on these social care needs and we should be addressing them, so it's important to do that. So I'm gonna go through a few things that Medicaid has accomplished in the last couple of years, in the last couple of minutes of my talk here, uh, uh, to, to enhance pediatrics. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, primary care reimbursement has been bench benchmarked to 80% of Medicare. <laughs> Prior to that, it was 70%. Uh, and so it leads, you know, to an increase in, in rates. Um, uh, there's a program called the Patient Centered Medical Home, and we have a specific, it's a, a national center for quality assurance program, but we have a, a New York state specific program. And through that, it allows for reimbursement um, at enhanced rates for pediatric primary care practices. And really this is, this is kind of like, you know, we do this really well in pediatrics. And, all pediatric practices should, should be part of these patient-centered medical homes. Uh, and um, if, if, you know, be, and especially since it does provide a different way to um, uh, finance the, the uh, an opportunity to finance the pediatric practices in primary care in a different way so that we can focus more time on taking care, good care of our patients using a team or based approach. Um, a few other things uh, we expanded coverage for community health worker services to pediatrics in the last year. Uh, we have coverage now for medical nutritional therapy services provided by dietitians and nutritions that can bill directly to Medicaid. We have a, um, uh, another opportunity that came out of chaos, which is we have a uh, memorialized telehealth policy that allows us at parity to conduct telehealth visits. So I know that's great for environmental health because there's nothing more important than understanding the environment in which kids live. And I have to tell you, I, there was a grant when I was a resident at Jacoby uh, that allowed us to go visit our patients' homes. And we would take like a home environmental history, then go visit the home. They, they were, it didn't correlate very well at all. I was very surprised at the difference in what I saw. Um, and a lot of it was based on my own impressions of, of what I thought people lived like in their own homes. Uh, and it really opened my eyes to the challenges that our families face. Uh, so um, reimbursement for e-consults, this is something new uh, and it's really amazing because now you can, you know how you do curbside consults? I know I see a specialist in the audience. So uh, you know how someone just pulls you aside? I have just a quick question I want to ask you about a patient, right? Well, now that quick question can be a question you ask specifically in the medical record to a specialist that is asynchronous. They reply to you about a patient. Uh, and um, with access to that medical records and both the provider who's asking and the provider who's answering can bill for that service, which is, I think, a great opportunity for environmental health and for a lot of the specialties in terms of providing access for, for our families. Um, and um, uh, uh, there was something else I wanted to say about that. And I cannot remember. All right. Anyway, uh, we also have reimbursement for adverse childhood experience screening. So something you should take advantage of. We also do reimburse for developmental screening. So please bill correctly for that. Um, and finally, I just want to talk about one thing, right? We talked about policy uh, you know, during this talk. I hope you got some you know, understanding of what it takes to make a policy change. I don't think it's possible to really show you the world that I spend most of my time in. But... You know, when I was a resident, um, the, uh, uh, I remember Dr. Caspi, our chairman of the department, saying, you know, oh, why, why do kids get bumped off of Medicaid every six months or every year? You know, they just have continuous coverage for all these kids, right? I graduated residency in 2003. Well, 
we have a formal request from the New York State Medicaid program to the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services uh, for continuous coverage for children from the ages of zero to six. We know from our experience that most kids are not bumped off because of a change in their economic status. Most kids are bumped off of Medicaid because of um, mom for, didn't fill out a letter, dad forgot to show up at an office, uh, they missed an appointment, they didn't do something, uh, and it's an administrative issue and not because of uh, a change in their economic status. So finally, um, so what does it take to improve policy as a pediatrician? First of all, um, I want to just give a lesson that, I, that was given to me uh, when Dr. Landrigan sent me off to represent him on a, on a New York State expert panel on trichloroethylene, of which I was not an expert, and vapor intrusion, of which I knew very little, right? He said to me, um, you're the only one in that room who's been up in the middle of the night with a premature newborn or performed a lumbar, a lumbar puncture on a baby. I want to say you're the only person who sat in a room with a mother crying and telling you their stories. You know, you're the only person who sat in the room and, and understands what your patients experience. Um, that makes you very different and changes your perspective. Being a, pre being a pediatrician and using that as your foundation has an incredible impact on the way you view policy. And so no one else sitting around the table except for other pediatricians knows what it means. You know, and when I think about the lesson that I learned, you know, Dr. Hirshhorn, uh, he, I, I was sitting in a morning uh, rounds uh, uh, when I was here during fellowship. And, you know, he said something so profound and it was so obvious that I should have learned it years before and I should have understood it. And it stayed with me the whole time. And I teach it to all my students, you know, when I'm on rounds with them in the hospitals that, you know, you start with understanding what the problem is. What's the chief complaint? And from that, you build your menu of, of differential diagnosis. And then you get a really good history and you rule out a lot of the diagnoses on your list until you finally get to what you think it is, then you perform your physical exam. And then, and then you decide what data and other information you need in order to help manage your patient. And that's exactly the same way public health and population health are. It's the same exact approach. And so as a pediatrician, you can do it. So, um, so the finally, uh, you know, keep in mind, right? First, be a pediatrician, participate in surveillance. If something's reportable, report it to your health department. There's a really important reason for that. And um, code when you're doing your billing, please code for other things that you don't, may not get reimbursed for, but it's really helpful for us for us to have in the Medicaid data. Participate in expert panels when asked to do so. You're the only one, you have a unique viewpoint. You're gonna provide, you know, because of there's more than just science that goes into these decisions, you don't have to be the expert, you just have to be the pediatrician. And uh, conduct program evaluation, you know, that helps us a lot in understanding whether what we're doing and implementing is actually, you know, efficient, accessible, it's safe. Provide feedback on implementation for program improvement. And also be aware that there are careers outside of clinical medicine. So finally, I want to say this about the five Ps, okay? I want to explain to you what I meant. Um, so persistence, never give up, because eventually we'll get where we need to go for kids. Perseverance, because there are always obstacles to accomplishing these goals, and it's profound understanding of the systems governing the things we want to improve on and require compromise involving working with all stakeholders. Persever perseveration, Repeat them over and over and over again because others might lose sight of where we need to go. Patients, these changes, the bigger the system, the longer it takes. And be patient. I'm okay with working on a five-year timeline, an eight-year timeline, a 10-year timeline because these programs are big, they're complicated, and because of that last thing, which is perspiration, is I get really nervous because sometimes you jigger the system in one way and you make it worse in another. Right, so you gotta be really careful about how you proceed along the way. And that's okay, because that makes up for better programs. And with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much, Dr. Graber. We so appreciate you being here with us to celebrate CH Day. I know we're running over. If anybody um, has time to say, is there one question in the audience? Uh, yes. So there's been so much about childhood tax credit and thinking about unconditional uh, 
cash transfer on a state level or on a New York level? Are there programs coming down the pipeline that are really dealing with that economic stability bottom of the pyramid? So, so when, I mean, when I think about the socioeconomic factors, I'm thinking about those, those like social determinants or social drivers of health, right? So, so it's not all just about giving money. There is, you know, cash assistance programs, and there is in Medicare and Medicaid ways to um, provide some funding for families. You know, with the housing, which is particularly challenging in New York City, you know, the, during in the 1115 waiver, there is going to be funding to support housing. Uh, on, you know, that funding will, you know, help people transition into better housing situations or stable housing. Uh, and uh, there are, um, uh, uh, you know, ways to support families through nutrition and ensuring better transportation and improving the homes they live in. And, and those things will have, you know, a socioeconomic impact for those families. Uh, in terms of, you know, other things, that's where we're starting. There are a lot of other things out there to try to help people and help families. There are tons of programs and, you know, I know in the being program, uh, there was uh, an attempt to connect families with uh, something called Peach. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, it's something to look at. I'm not all that familiar with it, but uh, there wasn't a lot of uptake and I'm not entirely sure why, but I think, it, you know, uh, it'd be good to reach out to the, to the folks at Montefiore to talk about that. Uh, so, you know, you always have to test the waters and see which programs are going to work as well. But I think this is the first, in my, in my opinion, to see this, that we're actually starting to delve into that realm, even though we've been talking about health equity since the beginning. You know, we practice health equity in our practice, right? So when we see patients, we treat everybody, you know, like, you know, from where they're coming from. We, we meet our patients where they're at, right? We don't force them to, you know, live up to our you know, our standards and what we expect from them, you know, it's, is we try to meet them where they're at because we're pediatricians. That's what we do. Right. And, um, and so, so this is trying to change the rest of that world to try to make it so that everybody has an equal shot at, at good health. So that's what I mean by addressing the socioeconomic factors. Okay. All right. Thanks.